And welcome once again to another edition of Community Cop. My name is Noel Lita, one of the co-founding members of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care. I'm here again with one of my co-hosts, Michael Gray, a.k.a. Big Mike. Namaste. And we'd like to welcome you, our viewing audience, to another edition. Uh, this is where truth and real talk occurs. And as is customary, because we have so much to discuss this week, uh, let's go straight into our historical piece. Uh, Michael, uh, I know you like to remind our viewing audience about the history of one of our great heroes, Hubert Harrison. His birthday was on 427, 1889. What about Herb, uh, Herbert Hubert Harrison, Michael? Yeah, with respect to time, let me just say real quickly that Hubert Harrison was one of the great intellectuals that we developed uh, this past century. So in the early 1900s, there was not a better scholar than Hubert Harrison. He was an autodidact, self-taught man that knew literally every subject under the sun. The brother was so bad, he used to have lectures in the Wall Street area and stood right in front of the Security Exchange um, Commission and would have 10,000 people out there, the majority white, listening to everything from philosophy, history, business, uh, warfare, you name the subject, other countries, international issues. Uh, Hubert Harrison did it all. He was called the Black Socrates of Harlem. And the brother was so bad, he was the one that introduced the great Marcus Mosiah Garvey to the Harlem community. Uh, so let's always remember Hubert Harrison, one of our truly great ones, and stood strong for our people. And uh, another incident that occurred uh, is the LAPD attack, attack on the Nation of Islam Mosque in April 27, 1962. Yeah, that um, attack on the mosque reverberated throughout the entire country because we know that the Nation of Islam is extremely law-abiding, sensitive to community needs, and very responsive to the Black community. And they go about their business uh, in a very quiet and sincere way. So for the LAPD to concoct the story claiming that they had to go into building because they had a complaint, it only shows you just how vicious uh, the LAPD was they actually shot seven members of the Nation of Islam, paralyzing one, um, uh, uh, William Rogers, and killing Ronald Stokes. So um, we definitely should never forget that. As I said, um, unarmed Black men and women in the mosque they shot seven, one permanently paralyzed and the other one dead. Um, and this was uh, a sort of a coming out of sorts for Malcolm in that way he had to fly there and he was the spokesperson for the um, Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the uh, Nation of Islam. And even the FBI picked up a certain vibe there on the way Malcolm viewed the situation which they used much later. And um, the way the Honorable Elijah Muhammad viewed the situation in calling for calm and restraint in that regard. So um, we should never forget that attack because the Nation of Islam has been such a great influence on our people and it has been able to teach and help and turn people from errant ways, whether it was alcohol and drug abuse, so many other things, criminality, prostitution, to turn them into productive uh, citizens um, in the black community. So um, an attack on the nation of Islam was truly an attack on us. And, and one of the things that we'll find out, anyone who reviews Community Cop will find out this, there's a persistent, a constant theme of the animus relationship between members of our community and law enforcement agencies and law enforcement officers. Uh, it's not happenstance 
that these uh, uh, tensions exist. You know, law enforcement officers, uh, police agencies, uh, whether it's we're talking about local authorities, local police or federal police officers, there's always been an animus, a hostile relationship primarily emanating from these agencies towards our community. As you stated, Michael, the Nation of Islam is a known fact that their members don't carry weapons. And not only did we have this happening uh, uh, in Los Angeles, and this is the anniversary of that particular attack, but the mosque in New York, the Nation of Islam mosque was attacked in uh, Harlem as well, mosque number seven, uh, uh, which resulted in the death of a police officer. And then there was another attack on the mosque uh, when they had their office uh, their mosque on uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, right. And it always was, and as you would think that the police would learn a lesson, but there's always what a, was a bogus phone call of a criminal act occurring within the mosque. You know, so, um, you know, that was an attack. It, it wasn't based on any, uh, really, any allegations of criminality that occurred within the mosque because everyone, everyone who knows the nation of Islam knows that crime does not happen within the mosque of the nation of Islam. You know, they have one of the, some of the greatest security patrols with the fruit of Islam. Police officers know this. Uh, so when they, uh, when they, you know, assemble at these mosques, you know, with uh, many officers and their weapons drawn sometimes, you know, they know, uh, or we know, it's simply because they want to uh, uh, flaunt what they think is their muscle and disrespect, uh, you know, not only the imam, but the uh, parishioners uh, within the mosque. So, you know, thank you for that particular update. Um, and also this update of the LA riots, which occurred on 429-92. Uh, and of course those riots was a result of uh, another horrific in incident uh, between uh, LA police officers and our community when they attacked uh, Rodney King and brutally beat him. It was video captured on video and played before the world and a white jury uh, found these officers, in spite of the fact that there was a video, found these officers innocent. Uh, and of course, the LA uh, community erupted and uh, we have uh, this, this uh, rebellion, uh, the LA rebellion. Uh, remind our viewing audience about the rebellion, Michael. Yeah, just want to just add to it because you, you pointed out things certainly extremely well. I would just say that uh, it was also Latasha Harlins. It wasn't just Rodney King. I think Rodney King was the last straw. Prior to that, uh, about a week, week and a half before that, Tasha Hollins was was killed, and they tried the case, and it was uh, the same result. The uh, Korean store owner was found guilty, but they suspended her jail time, and she was found guilty of manslaughter. But the judge uh, suspended the sentence and reduced it to four, uh, 400 hours of community service and like a $500 fine. Uh, the, 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 the judge, Joyce Collins, I think was her name. And so for uh, a white woman to put such um, a, a low value on black life, a little girl, 15 years old scholar, was killed like that viciously. That was the spark. And the last straw was when all of those uh, police officers, including Sergeant Kuntz and them who were um, exonerated in, in a state trial, which was the last straw, which started actually the, the LA riots. Or right. I should say the LA rebellion. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, for those who may not remember, this, this uh, murder was caught on video. You know, the young lady was had a back turn to the Asian uh, uh, store owner and she was literally walking out of the store and the Asian uh, woman shot her in the back of the head, killing her. And one of right. the judge's comments when she made the decision not to, to uh, sentence this Korean store owner to any jail time, not even a day, she said that her having to live with her conscience that she killed somebody was penalty enough. You know, that was an outrageous statement. It was an outrageous um, uh, decision of hers not to sentence someone convicted, as Michael stated, of manslaughter, of taking a life, to not even a day in jail, and then to pretend as if her penalty is her having to live with her conscience that she killed, uh, you know, an innocent uh, black girl. And as you stated, Michael, 
that anger, that properly, rightfully so, you know, members of the black community, uh, you know, because, um, you know, that's just such an outrageous decision by a judge. Uh, anything else on that, Mike? No, it's just that the close proximity of Latasha right. Holland's um, murder and the killer being exonerated with Rodney King, the two together became explosive. There go what happened in Los Angeles, right. the, the rebellion. And of course, America uh, would, as opposed to uh, deal with the cause, they want to deal with the response. You know, they want to deal, uh, according to them, with the inappropriate response of the LA community as a result to deal with the causes of these issues. But the last issue, Michael, uh, you uh, we talked about earlier, it was on 428, 1973. Some may remember New York City police officers killed, uh, shot a 10 year old child named Clifford Glover in the back in the South Jamaica community. Uh, Clifford Glover and his father was uh, going to his job um, early in the morning, the wee hours of the morning, when uh, New York City police uh, detectives stated they were investigating and looking for a robbery suspect uh, when they came upon uh, Clifford Glover and his father. Uh, according to Clifford Glover's father, he thought he was being robbed because he, and the, these officers were in plain clothes. They were in an unmarked car. They never announced themselves. And when him and his son uh, began to run, officers shot the 10 year old Clifford Glover in the back. Um, ultimately, the officer's name was Thomas Shea. Uh, ultimately, he was vindicated, he was not convicted. He claims that Clifford, he's seen a gun in Clifford Glover's hand. A gun was never found. And, uh, you know, of course, after that, the South Jamaica community rose up in the rebellion, uh, you know, to see a, a police officer shoot a 10 year old child in the back. And on the stand, when he was asked uh, by the prosecutor, uh, don't you know the difference between, because he was, as I said, he was looking for, a, a rob, allegedly looking for a robbery suspect, which was a grown man. He asked Clifford Glover, uh, uh, Trump, Officer Shea, don't you know the difference between a 10 year old child and a grown man? He said, all I seen was black. And uh, you know, if, if that's not a racist statement, you tell me what it is. But uh, as we constantly go through these historical pieces, we see that the animosity between law enforcement agencies and our community is one persistent theme, the level of hostile over aggressiveness on the behalf of police officers all throughout the country and throughout this, this nation's total history. There's never been a time when this didn't happen. So, uh, you know, all of these, these, these announcements or these pronouncements of some so-called uh, bringing together these two communities, unless you deal with what the issue is, the hostile sentiments that many white police officers have against members of the African-American community is not training, it's not any having no kumbaya meeting, is stopping law enforcement agencies, law enforcement officers, or the criminal justice system in its entirety of oppression, disenfranchising members of black community. You know, that's the only time where I can even believe that there's an opportunity for there to be a coming of the minds between law enforcement agencies and members of the African American community. Uh, Michael, do you have any comments on the shooting of Clifford Glover? I'll just say that this is um, a shame. And certainly, you know, um, in today's language, uh, Shea would not be able to get away with that. He would have been um, much more conciliatory. But at that time in the 70s, a police officer could basically say anything because there was no such thing at that time as a police officer being convicted of killing a Black person. That just wasn't going to happen. And one of the one of the reasons uh, why one of the only reasons why we're getting convictions uh, today because there's throughout the country there's been I don't know how many police officers who are convicted of murder, uh, you know, with the advent of these body cams, with the advent of cameras on on uh, police vehicles, you know, the public is getting to see up close something that's been happening for years, for generations, always. There never was a time it didn't happen where police officers murdered members of the black community outright murdered but when you don't see it when the public doesn't get a chance to see it you know the police of course come along with their general explanations that they fear for their life that they gave a, a verbal command that they gave a warning uh and the person uh refused to obey their warning and therefore they used um deadly physical force so uh with the advent of these video cameras as you say to michael we're starting to see you know something that's been happening 
you know, for generations. All right, fast forward to today. Uh, we have some, some old stories we want to discuss, Michael. The um, officer the shooting, many people uh, may remember Officer Kim Porter shot brother Dante Wright. Uh, this is the officer who, before she shot him, yelled taser, taser, taser. Um, that her case has not been prosecuted as of yet. I'm not even certain if they made a decision to. But Michael, give us the family uh, update on her case. Well, the, they just had the funeral the other day uh, for um, Dante Wright. And already uh, nationwide, they're all the same, the very same thing the chief said about her. Uh, chief Tim Gannon characterized the incident as an accident. As I watched the video and listened to the officer's commands, it is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This appears to me, from what I viewed, and the officer's reaction and distress immediately after that this was an accidental discharge. What gives him the right to develop a narrative that went all over the country, and I dare say all over the world, that it was an accident for her to say taser, 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 and then follow up on that by shooting her duty uh, service uh, weapon, killing. Dante Wright, I looked at it and I'm very concerned about how we look at the eyes through what lens are we looking at when we see certain incidents. I saw the very same thing all of you saw. I saw two police officers trying to handcuff Wright and I don't know whether it was nervousness or ineptitude, but in any event, he was having problems handcuffing Wright. So at that point, Wright moved while uh, once the officer could not. So I don't know what was said, but something made Wright move. And when he moved, Porter, Potter, started yelling, taser, taser, taser. Now, people are believing from what they saw that she was talking to him. She was not talking to Dante Wright. When she said taser, 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 she was not talking to Dante Wright. In other words, be prepared, I'm getting ready to tase you. She was telling the police officers to move out of her way. She was behind the two police officers who in fact was affecting the arrest. She was with another new officer fresh out of the academy that she was training. She has 26 years of experience. She went to her power hand, pulled out her duty weapon and coldly and callously shot him one time. After she shot him, she understood the language. That's what 26 years of experience gives you. She said, oh, blip, I shot him. Well, the officers that, that, that killed Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they wrestled him to the ground because he was allegedly selling bootleg CDs and DVDs. When they wrestled him to the ground, and pulled out their weapon and shot him. After they shot him twice, they said, stop resisting, stop resisting. Because they knew the language. They knew that if you didn't see it and you heard it and you heard gunshots, all you're going to hear police officers say, stop resisting. 
which makes you assume that he's resisting. So they later uh, claimed that he was trying to find their weapon, trying to grab one of their weapons. So in any event, I'm saying that Potter was talking to those officers to move out of her way. Once she saw they couldn't cuff him, she said, I'll handle this. As the uh, person with the most time there, she made them move out of the way as they moved to their left and right and cleared the way, she shot them. So I do not follow the narrative that Chief Gannon said that she just made a mistake. It was no accident. This was cold-blooded and callous, and I'm not going to see anything with their lying eyes. I'm going to see it with my own African eyes, and from what I saw, she was telling them to move out of her way. I got this. And then later, for her to say, oh, blip, I shot him, means nothing to me. That was a callous, cold-blooded act, and you need to pay for that. You need to uh, answer to what your actions did that day. Hi, uh, Michael, is, is there some new um, information as it relates to her relationship to her agency or her department? Did she resign? She resigned, yes, sir. She was right. able to resign, and as you well know, Noel, because I've heard you say it a thousand times, a dirty cop in a dirty shooting should not be allowed to resign. She has right. resigned and protected her 26-year-old pension. It's protected now at this moment. They should make her, they should not accept her resignation, which they've already done, she should still be on the clock, and there needs to be a rigorous investigation, and then obviously indicted, and um, the prosecution. Right. Okay. Um, and also, uh, a side note, but it's a related note. You know, the viewing audience must understand uh, that officers throughout the nation, with the advent of these body cameras, with the advent of these dash cam uh, recordings, Officers are being trained, if not officially, unofficially. You know, when officers get together in their groups or in their training groups or when officers uh, attend uh, their functions, they're being thoroughly trained that when you're involved in one of these situations, that the camera is running, say things like gun, even if there is a gun, it is not a gun. But if you, if you uh, intend to use deadly physical force or get a little aggressive, make these pronouncements, even though those of us who look at the video, as you say to Michael, in cases where they say stop resisting, stop resisting, individuals are not resisting. And I'm looking at the video and saying, why is he saying stop resisting? There is no resistance. These are things that they're throwing out. You know, it's, it's political, it's theater. They're throwing out for the audience, for the viewing audience, because they understand that they're being recorded uh, before they do some actions, which they may receive some criticism. They're throwing these terms out, gun. You know, uh, from we've seen that from Sean Bell, uh, you know, on, on down when officers before they shot a barrage of, of, of um, bullets into his vehicle, one of the officers said gun. There was no gun. They never found a gun. Uh, in these recent incidents, uh, you know, officers will say gun. And then when the dust settled, there was no gun. They made these pronouncements so the public could say, well, somebody, one of the officers said gun. So the officers thought that there was a grave uh, a threat of death or serious physical injury. Thereby, he used deadly physical force. In that case, when she said taser, taser, you know, um, I'm not trusting all of these pronouncements that these officers are making. Um, uh, some people may say it's a part of the training. Uh, and so a lot of these videos, you know, from stop resisting to, yo, he's having a gun, he has a gun. I think these pronouncements are thrown out there because they understand that they're being videotaped. And you know they think that these pronouncements are going to provide an explanation or an excuse or justification for their actions. This is a part of what officers are being trained to say now that they have these video cameras. And like I said, if it's not an official training, it's unofficial training when officers get together. You know, when you go to the scene of these incidents, somebody's running, if somebody's getting physical, or if you intend to, to, to be a little forceful, throw it out there, stop resisting, stop resisting. Uh, even though there's no resistance. So, you know, um, so, and I agree with you, Michael, she should not have been uh, allowed to resign. They should have held up her resignation pending the outcome of this particular case. But we see in a lot of cases, and we're going to talk about one today, where officers are allowed to retire prior to 
um, taking care of business uh, that occurred while they were employed, you know, and we know in New York City Police Department, you know, that doesn't happen a lot of times when it should happen. Uh, closing comments on that case? Yeah, I would say that Chief Gannon knows full well that that Glock weighs approximately three times what a taser weighs. Chief Gannon knows full well that her duty weapon is on her strong side, the right side. The taser is on the left side. And since her, since when you go across your body to get your taser, it's put on what would be a, a backside holster, which would be literally a left hand holster. So you can go across your body and grab the weapon. In her particular case, it was back, it was um, front side. So you literally have to grab it with your left hand to get it out of the holster and then put it in your right hand. Chief Gannon knows that fully well, he's a chief. So he knows there's a stark difference in a duty weapon, a Glock, which is black, and a taser, which is yellow. So for him to say it was an accident is what developed this narrative that all these people are repeating. It was an accident. It was not an accident. And even when there is an accident, you pay for the result of your actions, even if it was an accident. But for him to say without an investigation, without even talking to her, to say it was an accident, and now all on radio, TV, they saying it was an accident, that is the height of irresponsibility for a chief that's supposed to be a part of the finder of facts and to initiate a real investigation as opposed to protecting somebody who's the president of their union. And uh, you know, another another thing to add context to that, Michael, uh, you know, that's one of the flipping uh, uh, explanations they give to a lot of uh, African Americans being murdered at the hands of police officers. Just say it was an accident. We you know we seen that with Timothy Stansbury in an effort to excuse the officers who are well-trained, one of the most sophisticated police departments, you know, in the world, you know, right here in America, um, to just throw it out there that it was an accident. As you stated, Michael, it's not an accident. You know- uh, Well, you know um, the favorite I, one. Noel, you know the favorite one, right? Which one? The police officer didn't wake up that morning planning on killing <laughs> anybody. That's another explanation. You know, <laughs> as if a civilian who may not wake up in the morning uh, uh, in his mind to kill somebody, but throughout his day, he winds up killing somebody and that excuse is used for them as well. You never hear that, you know, when you, when they convict or charge somebody uh, a civilian with murder. But, um, you know, this, you know, accident, when I think of an accidental shooting by a police officer, I think of an officer engaged in a gun battle who may miss the perpetrator that he's attempted to shoot, but may strike somebody in behind them or his bullet may ricochet and hit an innocent civilian. To me, that's an accidental shooting or if it was possible for an officer to drop his weapon and it to go off, uh, you know, if he's in chasing somebody and he drops it and it would somehow go off, which never, never happens, that would be an accident. What we're seeing with these officers intentionally engaging in behavior that causes the death or injury to another person, um, you know, I always say, what part of it was an accident? Was it an accident when she pulled out her taser? Was she, I mean, her, her, her weapon? Was it an accident when she pointed it at him? No, she intended to do it. Was she an accident when she pulled the trigger? As you say to Michael, you know, uh, she's a, a, a very seasoned officer and she should know the difference between a strong arm, weak arm, because the taser and her weapons on two different sides. So this has to be some accountability and what, they're, what they are doing and classifying it as an accident is an attempt to excuse her of responsibility for an actions. And that's totally unacceptable. Totally understandable. Okay, Michael, there's another case we want to go over before we get current. Um, after the uh, the conviction of the officer that murdered uh, Joy Floyd, uh, Reverend Sharpton and Attorney Crump uh, had a press conference, and you want to make some comments as it relates to their statements made during that press conference. Yes, I want to just say from the outset that I have never seen in all my years on the planet. I've never seen every station, MSNBC, CNN, 
all of these other channels, even ESPN, a sports channel. Everybody went to uninterrupted that press conference. Now the press conference is what I referred to last week briefly as a costume party. Mm -hmm. This was a coming out of sorts where white America without commercial gave them two hours to perform. They actually went from person to person congratulating each other. And it started out with Keith Ellison who actually put together the team that prosecuted uh, Chauvin. That was fine. But after that is when the real party started. This was a Hollywood production at its finest. You had Reverend Sharpton come out, speak, lead them in prayer, uh, and then went on the, the call, uh, referred to Benjamin Crump as uh, the Black, the uh, Attorney General for Black America. That wasn't the attorney general that got you off, Sharpton. You faced a 67 count indictment. It was the attorney at war that got you out. Alton H. Maddox Jr. Alton H. Maddox Jr. That's who got you out of jail. You would have been looking at 67 counts. You still be in jail to this day. And that goes back over 30 years ago when that happened. Yet you call this man, you you was trying to call him attorney at war, then you changed it to the attorney general of black America. He is nothing but a settlement czar. That's all he is, a settlement czar. He's not uh, 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 an attorney general for black America. He's an attorney general for white America. He works for the white man. That whole showcase was the white man. You had Grammys, Emmys, Oscars. You had uh, Whisper Plays, um, Tony Awards. They had all that stuff for, for plays, for movies, for TV. They had all of that. It was a Hollywood production. You, you only thing you needed was Al Jose and the Sing Mammy. That was mm. nothing but a coon show. They should be ashamed of themselves. You got one police officer uh, took the. Uh, took the, uh, f fell on the sword, did not act up, took it uh, on the chin. Three officers that participated in the murder of George Floyd is walking around in the street right now. And these coons are celebrating each other. All these high fives, all these uh, fist bumps and all this hugging and all this stuff, all this crying saying, Oh, I could breathe now. I could breathe now. You know you was breathing. You was breathing when you got the $27 million. And you got the nerve to say you can breathe now. All of them saying I could finally breathe. Why don't you stop this stuff? White people gave you two hours. They put a crown on your head that night. That was a setup to say you are in charge of Black America. And if you follow his lead, you'll get your $27 a million dollars when something happened to your family. Now, I'm not throwing shade on the family. The Floyd Flam family, I'm sure, loved George Floyd. His brother spoke very highly of, him, highly of him the whole time. He didn't wait for that night. All the family members loved George Floyd, and I'm convinced of that. But I know this Hollywood production that Charlton was given and Ben Crump who's nothing but a settlement czar. He's not no attorney at war, and he certainly is not a attorney general for Black America. It was a farce. They put a crown on Sharpton's head that day. He's supposed to be the king now. He's supposed to be the point man for Black America. It was a farce. It was nothing but a Hollywood production you've never seen in your life. Two uninterrupted hours given the Black people who just was involved in a criminal case. And the bad thing about it, it was Keith Ellison that brought home the bacon in this one. 
and the team he puts together because that district attorney in that area was not going to take the case. So he became the special prosecutor. Consequently, he was the one that brought home the bacon, the team that he picked together to do that. And he, by the way, is the attorney general of the state of Minnesota. They even came in him when he was sworn into Congress. When he was um, a congressman, he got sworn in with the Quran because he's a Muslim. They made a whole lot of noise about that till they found out that the Quran he had was um, Thomas Jefferson's Quran. That he, he, he pledged um, you know, duty to America as a congressperson on that Quran and all the white folks had to go home and, um, quiet after that. Because they thought if it had it been his own personal Quran, they would have had an argument. But once they found out it was Thomas Jefferson's, they couldn't say anything. So in any event, that whole thing last week, a week ago today, was a farce. It was a sham. And you should see how white people are still picking our leaders. They're telling you who to follow. And at the same time, they're telling you who not to follow. So this settlement czar is now uh, all to Maddox. He's now the baddest lawyer on the block. He's now Johnny Cochran, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Sandwich in Houston. He can't pronounce none of their names. That mush mouth little coward. He's, and Sharpton should be ashamed of himself. He couldn't get you off of those 67 counts. Attorney Maddox did it. He got you off without calling one witness. He undressed every charge that they put against you. And damn it, you knew you was guilty. And yet he right. got you all. All right, I'd just like to add uh, two points, what you said, and you covered it uh, very well. Um, the reason why uh, I think uh, Crump is, is properly categorized as the settlement czar, because in the overall majority of cases that he handled, there's never a conviction of police officers. In this particular case, because of the video, because of the video, and as you said, because of the prosecutor, there was a conviction, uh, thankfully so. But what we usually see in all of the cases that Crump handles is that there's not a conviction of police officers, or there's really a conviction and an appropriate um, incarceration. You know, so, uh, you know, he can uh, parade or peruse around as if he is responsible for the conviction of the officer. Uh, which he's not. Uh, Mike, you want to say another point before I make my second point, or you want to wait? I just want to say Donella, Donella Frazier is a 17-year-old girl who videotaped the whole thing. Right. Donella Frazier. Her and Keith Ellison, those are the reasons we know who George Floyd is. Right. And, and, and like you said, Michael, when you look at so many of the cases that uh, he covers, and he you know, because the media props him up, gives him all the exposure, and because of his affiliation with the civil, uh, silver rights leaders and organizations, you know, he's now the point man, because as you stated, uh, you know, district attorneys around the country are comfortable in working with him. So, you know, one of the first things he encouraged the families to do is discourage the community from responding, you know, just be very peacefully. Um, you know, while if I was the attorney, my only thing I want to talk about is justice for my victim. Uh, but uh, so, you know, uh, uh, because of the video of, of what uh, Officer Chauvin did and how he laid on uh, or, st or nailed on the neck, you know, that's why he was successful. This had very little to do with Crump. As you said, he got the settlement money. Uh, secondly, I want to mention that, you know, the press conference, in my humble opinion, we talked about it last week, was a strategic mistake. You know, when the officer, when one of the officers, and there's four, uh, was convicted of those three charges. Of course, we expect the family and the attorneys and anyone affiliated as well as the community to be happy with the pronouncement of a conviction of a, a second degree murder. But in my opinion, you don't display your, your, your happiness until you know the sentencing of the officer, because we've seen in the past officer convicted of second degree murder and get a, a very few jail time. And then the conviction and the sentence of the other three officers. I think if you're a strategist, a legal strategist, uh, you know, based upon what we've seen in the society, you cannot show the society any happiness that you're, you're happy, that you're satisfied, any satis satisfaction until it's all done with. Then you can applaud yourself. I mean, of course, you want to go home and, and be happy that uh, these this officer was convicted, uh, you know, three charges. But I think you have to stay 
paint, you have to keep your war paint on. You have to let them see that, no, we're not happy. We want him to receive the fullest and the most stiffest penalty that he can possibly receive. And then we want to see the office, other three officers involved, convicted and properly sentenced. Then you can have this kind of announcement before the public that the family is satisfied, that there's level of satisfaction, that you're happy, that you're overjoyed, that you're clapping. You know, because so many times we've seen, once they give us one, they lend back and, and then try to uh, be a little softer on the other three. But as I stated, the officer hasn't even been sentenced yet. So I think it's premature to celebrate. I mean, you can say that you're pleased with the conviction, but we're still mad. We're still angry, we're still upset. We still want justice because we haven't gotten justice yet. Justice is, is the arrest, uh, the uh, prosecution, the conviction and the sentencing. That's when we have uh, some semblance of justice. You know, and that hasn't happened yet. So as you say to Michael, that performance, I think is a little premature. And for somebody making uh, as much money as the crumps, you know, to consistently engage in, uh, I think, strategic mistakes is, uh, you know, re a revelation. <laughs> so I think when you, when you, uh, coined him the settlement czar, that's exactly what he is. He's like that guy from the movie, A Few Good Men. At the end of the movie, he says, oh, this is what a courtroom looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, so the final uh, catch up we want to before we talk about the recent shooting of uh, brother Andrew Brown is the Washington AG uh, Merrick Garland uh, announced on Monday that the Department of Justice is going to investigate the Louisville Police Department to really? Sister Breonna Taylor when they did a search warrant on that house. Now, one thing, uh, you know, of course, uh, the officers, the local uh, prosecutor, has decided not to prosecute uh, the officers who, who uh, went through the front door. And one of the things that we bring up here on the Community Cop over and over is we never hear any talk about the search warrant. You know, it is a known fact that the officers lied in the application to the judge, you know, to get the search warrant, to do a no, you know, not search warrant of our house. And that is not discussed. Um, so um, whether or not AG Merrick Garland is going to look into that, I doubt it because in his announcement, that he's going to, the Department of Justice is going to investigate that department. He talked about, you know, their patterns and practices. No one is, no one but community cop continues, and not even Crump. <laughs> you know, he's not still angry. And that's why I said, until you receive justice, you have to remain angry. You have to remain on point. But it seems as if once he gets a settlement, he's off to the next horrific police killer. You know, once he receives a settlement for his, his client, he's no longer angry. You know, he's on to the next dollar. Um, you know, the issue of the search warrant, the application to the judge for the search warrant, the issue of the officers perjuring themselves on their application is a big deal. And though that's being overlooked, it's not mentioned, as we say here on Community Cop, there's a black police officer in Texas right now being, uh, he was arrested for murder for the same reason of lying on the application to the judge. So we'll see if the AG is going to make an issue of it. I doubt it uh, because of the, or the, the, the attorney, Crump, is not making the issue out of it. Any comment on that, Mike? No, you, you, you hit it out the ball. Okay, Michael, let's talk about <clears throat> the recent shooting of Brother Andrew Brown in North Carolina. On the same day that the, uh, the conviction of all, they announced the conviction of Officer Chauvin, North Carolina police officers shot and killed unarmed man uh, Andrew Brown in North Carolina. They claim they were executing a arrest warrant uh, for him. Uh, since the shooting, uh, all the officers in North Carolina are mandated to have body cameras on. Um, the, there's a reluctance and a hesitancy of the authorities to make the body cams uh, uh, public, uh, which is causing uh, great questions uh, by the public and great concerns. Uh, three of the officers involved resigned, seven are on leave, one retired. When you add that, that only elevates the concern. Uh, we recently learned that the family conducted a um, autopsy and discovered that he was shot in the back of the head. That was a kill shot. Uh, but there's this hesitancy of authorities to release the body footage, uh, the body cams of these police officers. And that is raising so much issue. Uh, in the days where the public is calling for transparency uh, as it relates to these police officers. That is why they have the cameras, um, uh, you know, and uh, there's a reluctancy of the authorities to release the cameras. Michael, what are your thoughts on this particular shooting? Well, as you well know, because we've done it for years, 
we talked about these Blue Lives Matter laws that uh, that are in, in existence. Consequently, they have uh, been successful in being able to to have only a judge's consent in in many states. Only a judge can force uh, that police agency to show videotape footage to either the public or just to the family. That has happened over the last few years. We warned you when they were doing this. In some states, only the police commissioner is in charge of that or a judge or in some certain situations like in Chicago was the mayor who held it up. So until a judge's order finally allowed uh, us to see what happened to Laquan McDonald by you know, um, police officer Van Dyke. So in these situations, it's gonna take a judge's order. Now, this county uh, person, his name is uh, from Elizabeth City um, uh, County in North Carolina. The county person is R. Mitchell Cox. And he told the family attorney, Bakari Sellers, I'm not effing going to be bullied. This were his actual words. He said, I'm not effing going to be bullied. In other words, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm not going to show you the video in its entirety. He showed the family 20 seconds. You talk about being disrespectful. They waited all of this time and then waited later that day. And when he finally showed him it, it was 20 seconds of redacted material, a piece here and a piece there. Now, even in those 20 seconds, at no point did you see Andrew Brown threaten police officers in any way. And he was shot in the back of the head. So what is he really saying when he tell you he's not gonna be bullied? He is telling you he knows his job better than anyone else. Anything outside of what he says is his job is tantamount to you trying to bully him. So he says it was his decision to doctor and redact and show the family 20 seconds. That is similar to George Wallace standing up in front of the University of Alabama in saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, and not allowing black students to enter. This is what he was saying to the family. I'm not going to allow you because y'all are telling everybody this is wrong. I'm not gonna allow you to bully me. So you're not gonna see it. He doesn't care what black people think. He is securing his job. That county will reelect him now in North Carolina for him taking that stance. He doesn't need black votes to get back in to where he's at right now. So he's just showing you what he really thinks about black people by saying the words, I'm not gonna be effing bully. In other words, the hell with you. And you know, when you when you take knowledge of the atmosphere in the nation, you know, after the conviction of Officer Chavin after the video footage of him nailing on someone's neck for nine minutes and, and over nine minutes, uh, I think 26 or 46 seconds. Uh, when you look at some of the other horrific police shootings and some of the police convictions, you think that there would be more sensitivity, you know, based on the time that we in and the, and the atmosphere in the nation, but the arrogance and the level of disrespect that this department has, um, uh, the way they, when the family met with them recently, uh, they tried to dictate uh, who can come in they tried to, to eliminate uh, the attorneys um, from coming into the room. As you say to Michael, they only showed the family 20 seconds of, of videos when, you know, I, who knows how many minutes of video that they have because so many officers had the video. There's such a lack of transparency. That's why I'm saying family, when they talk about this, bringing police officers and community of color together, it's all political theater. They only want to have this coming together when it's advantageous for them. 
Uh, they only want to feign as if there's some sincere, sincere attempts to bring the community and law enforcement agencies together. If officers in that particular agency messed up, uh, committed crimes, murdered this man, and you have the evidence in the video footage, then release the footage. That's why they have that. Now, I know in North Carolina, they have a law stating that uh, a judge have to authorize it, but that could have happened already. And when you couple that up with the treatment of the family, when they did uh, have that particular meeting, there's such a level of arrogance and disrespect. And this is the problem that we're having. Uh, this brother, you know, was shot, was killed by the bullet to the back of his skull. <clears throat> we already uh, seen in history past. Uh, we know the law as it relates to a fleeing individual, if he was fleeing or if he was just in fear of his, his uh, life, uh, because that is the atmosphere that many black men have. You now, when police officers come with guns drawn, there's a fear. Now, you, you know, uh, if self-preservation is the first law of nature, you know, you have to utilize some of your options. Uh, we don't know what happened uh, as it relates to uh, our not seeing, you know, all of the cameras, all of the images. But when, the, when you talk about the officers that are resigned, when you talk about the officers that retired and the officers that are administrative uh, leave, uh, you know, and when you talk about the agency, the department heads not being transparent, there's th these are the things that create this atmosphere and they know it. They don't care. They're arrogant, they're racist, they're white supremacist. <clears throat> and as it relates to a lot of commentaries talk about training, training has nothing to do with these incidents. This is pure out racism, white supremacy. Uh, this is a pure um, uh, revelation of how many police officers throughout the nation do not value black lives. And that's why the coinage Black Lives Matter is important uh, because in the eyes of these law enforcement, it doesn't. I mean. This, this situation, this incident happened the same day that Chauvin uh, was found, was announced uh, and found guilty when they made the announcement that he was guilty of murder. You think that would affect the officers? You think that prior to affecting this arrest warrant that they would have had some conversation about, uh, you listen, you know, uh, let's be careful. You know, the heat is on as it relates to, uh, you know, our behavior. All of us have cameras and video cameras, but they're like a bloody, bloody mouth wolf you know they taste blood they can't stop they're incapable of stop you know from the time we talked about earlier from Clifford Glover to today they cannot stop white police officers have murdered black men throughout the country throughout this country its entire history ever since there was first police officers the the, the animosity between police officers and the black community have existed it never will stop it's never going to stop this is a part of America you know, and this is what we have to recognize. It's not a lack of training. White police officers have been murdering black men infinitum. The only difference today is we have video footage. We have cameras. We're seeing it. Everyone has a front seat to what's occurring, you know, um, and, and the inability to acknowledge that in this particular case, the inability of the police chief and the authorities to be transparent shows that there's a lack of genuine uh, interest in bringing our community and law enforcement agencies together. They are in the business to protect themselves, even when they murder members of our community. They don't care. Um, they only cares, care about the reputation of their particular agency. And uh, I think that's abominable. Um, I think they ought to uh, be transparent and there should definitely be a push. Uh, and and uh, you know, I'm even a little concerned whether or not they're gonna dock up some of the, the, the images you know, that they've had so long. I know one of the explanations that the the uh, authorities is given that some of the cameras are foggy and so what, you know, show us what you have. You know, that's true, genuine transparency. And for those who are a little confused as to the reluctance of these authorities to be forthcoming with this information, they shouldn't be. You know, the objective is to excuse the cover to protect, not justice. That's, that's, that's all the way down the line as it relates to us. You know, it, it may not even be on the, on the menu. Well, and I concur with everything you've said. That the question that so many of our people are posing now is why are there so many shootings in the back where allegedly uh, there's a Supreme Court law, it's law, federal law, with respect to a fleeing felon? But obviously, this is not being adhered to uh, and is not being challenged by local district attorneys when a police officer shoots somebody in the back. Now, I believe, and, and as you said, Noel, 
you pointed out that this has always been the case. Just want to remind people that might not know not only uh, what you would now call police agencies, whether it's marshals, sheriffs, uh, whatever it might be, or police officers, correction officers. These were the very same people that were slave catchers and then overseers, the correction officers, overseers once you're captured, police officers trained to track down uh enslaved africans so the president himself uh george washington a slave escaped from george washington's mansion well what did he do he put out a poster for only judges arrest he didn't know where she was at this was during the time where the white house was in with the executive mansion, which it was at the time, was in Philadelphia. And she escaped from free blacks in Philadelphia while they while Martha, the first lady, was having dinner with George in the White House. She slipped in the in the executive mansion. She slipped out, free blacks, put her on a steamship to New York all the way to New Hampshire. Free Blacks jeopardized their own freedom and got her out of there and paid for it and got her out there and snuck her. And so by the time they was looking for her, she was nowhere to be found because she was already on a ship going to New Hampshire. And that's the kind of commitment we had at that time. I'm saying now that pol police officers are acting as if Everything is on the line. When you have a person's name, their license number, the license plate, they can get away because you're going to get them later anyway. So there's no, there was no need to shoot uh, Brother Brown in the back. There was no need to shoot Dante Wright dead center in his chest, a 20-year-old black man. And they brought up the dirty, the dirt they brought up was a warrant. They didn't tell you it was really a summons back when he was like maybe 16 years old and he didn't go to court and pay whatever the summons was. They converted that to a warrant and took years and years. So when they caught him and they killed him, after the fact, they looked at the record and said he had an outstanding warrant on us, on him. That can happen to any of us. It's just dirty. Giuliani was good at that. And I and I also want to dispel the notion uh, that they're they're bringing forth is that there's an attack on police officers, uh, and that police officers' job is becoming much harder because of the criticism that they're receiving. You know, if police officers are being held accountable for assaulting and murdering men, in, individuals in our community, then so be it. This is not an attack, and this is what uh, you know pushback has to be. They're claiming that our insistence or our demand for justice and our response, whether it be in rebellions or in marches or our criticism or calling for defunding of police officers, um, is an attack on the, the uh, law enforcement. <laughs> you know, as I stated, you know, the police officers murdering African Americans have always occurred in this country. You know, it's never a time that it didn't happen. And our demand for accountability, for justice, shouldn't be interpreted as an attack on, on law enforcement, you know, because there is no tech. I mean, if you look, you know, at the image and, you know, from Bloody Sunday, it was a police involved. <laughs> no, Bloody right. Sunday exists. It's called Bloody Sunday because it was the police officers that were drawing blood. You know, when you look at the role that the police played in the civil rights in, in, in the South, when you look at the, the role that they played in the murder of Fred Hampton, police officers, white police officers ahead, murdered individuals in our community throughout this entire nation's history. And they haven't stopped, they won't stop, they can't stop, they unable to stop. Murdering being aggressive of black men or members of our community is something that they can't stop. So this is not an attack uh, on law enforcement officers who are doing their job. Mm -hmm. This is an attack on what we've been seeing, what we've been experiencing at the hand of police. It's documented, you know, it's documented facts, the interactions between white police officers or police agencies and members of our community. This is this is this is not nothing new, you know. And their inability to deal with it, it has nothing to do with training. It has to do with the lack of respect the white police officers 
have for members of our community. And that's why our community should demand that officers that want to work in our community, that they must come from our community. There has to be some reflection of the community from these particular agencies. So this new commentary that they're trying to push, this sympathetic tone that they're trying to put on, on police officers, nobody criticizes police officers that do their job. And there are many police officers that do do their job, but there are many right. police officers who do not. And there are many police officers, even those who do their job, who don't criticize those officers who do not. So that's where the criticism uh, should come and should go. But this, this problem of law enforcement is historic. It's nothing new. It's a continuation of what we've seen in the past. The only thing that's happening in 19 and two, 2021 is that we have video recorders. Everyone has it on their phone. Everyone has it on their house now. And then the police officers have their uniform. So we're getting up, up front, close seated, all of this. So I just don't like some of the commentaries that are being pushed out there and the lack of acknowledgement between the hostilities that white police officers and police agencies have had on the African-American community throughout this nation's entire history. That was beautiful, brother. Well, well put. Right, okay. All right, uh, any closing comments on this? We're gonna you know, keep the family abreast um, you know, of this particular case. You know, this is a hot issue. Uh, you know, um, I don't know whether or not next Tuesday there's gonna be another police murder that's recorded. Uh, you know, um, but the way the, and the, the rapid pace that these shootings are occurring, you know, is no reason for us not to think that's a possibility. But oh, okay, I said I see. All right, closing comments, Michael. Yeah, just want to thank everybody that I see outside, man. People will holler from their car. People see you on the street, give you that a boy, hug you, and and say, brother, love what you're doing, man. Keep it up. Some even say, get them, man, get them, get them. So. I just want to say that much love, much love to uh, to our people for respecting what we do on Community Cop. They speak so highly of yourself and Julian that just want to thank everybody that does that. Black man, black woman, protect the black child. Accept your own and be yourself. You know, on behalf of Community Cop, we like to, of course, thank our engineer, Veronica Kitt, Nat Woods, Yola Berry. We like to thank uh, Big D. We like to thank you, our viewing audience. Lenny Lou, Kitty Cat, Little Mo, I love you all. And Community Cop, we appreciate you watching. Uh, share um, the videos on YouTube, like the videos, um, and uh, continue watching. Uh, we get the opportunity to discuss these issues from our vantage point, which it doesn't happen on your conventional TV station. So we appreciate you watching. We appreciate the comments. See you next week. Peace.